Hello, welcome and good evening to everyone. It's been a great pleasure to be associated again with CCI on this wonderful evening. I just talked to my panelists. The weather is very beautiful everywhere, all over India. And uh, just like sometimes we say the harvest season begins, the same way, many of the times we feel that now the respiratory season has begun. So not in a bad sense, but actually we are definitely getting our OPTs are getting flourished more and more and we're getting a lot of respiratory patients. We don't know whether it's the fourth wave of COVID which is coming up or whether it is just the viral infections which are coming up or whether it is seasonal flu which is coming up. But whatever is the case, the most common symptom by which the, all these patients come to us is by cough. And thank you, CCI, for bringing this very important talk on, see, on the cough and the different presentations about cough. So in the next two hours or so, we have wonderful panelists and we're going to discuss about uh, the different uh, approach towards the management of cough, the different causes of cough. We will be again uh, talking about this new entity which our very dear and our own Dr. Krishna has introduced and that is cough of unknown origin, CUO. So just like, you know, whenever we get a patient of fever of unknown origin, pyrexia of unknown origin, we always tend to over-investigate the patient. We feel that it's not our domain, it's a domain basically of the physician or MD medicine person. The same way, I think if this new term gets introduced of CUO, so we all put CEO, COO, so a lot of CFO, and now there will be one more term into this, and that is CUO. So um, without wasting much of the time, and um, um, first of all, I would like to thank CCI, Chase Council of India, for uh, uh, having this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishna. Thank you, Ravi Bhai. Thank you, my dear friend Vijay Kumar. And uh, I would like to introduce all my panelists. We are going to have a super dhamaka of this cough and anything which you have doubts about cough. My young panelists, they are so experienced and they know each and everything about cough. So keep your doubts ready. And today, we will be having everything about this cough, in and out, everything about cough. So we have a very important panelist, starting with uh, Dr. Vishnu Sharma. So Dr. Vishnu Sharma, he's an MD and DNB in respiratory medicine, and he's professor and head at the Department of Respiratory Medicine at AJ Institute of Medical Sciences at Mangalore. So Mangalore has a very beautiful weather, and I'm sure that Dr. Vishnu Sharma is in his peak of uh, career, and he will be definitely taking us to the great heights about this uh, different aspects about cough. Welcome to Vishnu. Then we have Dr. Gopal Krishnan. Dr. M. S. Gopal Krishnan. He is a, a diploma as well as DNB in respiratory medicine, and he is a, a interventional pulmonologist at Ayush Hospital at Vijayawada. So at CCI, we get people and we get faculty from all over India. So that is one of the most beautiful thing about uh, CCI that um, we get lots of new panelists. And they're all very much experienced. Many times, India being such a huge country, we don't know who's practicing at the other part of the city or the other part of the country is in uh, very far to know. We don't know who are practicing in our own city. We have my dear friend, Dr. Lovlin Mangla. He's again a DNB in respiratory medicine. He's also done PDCC in interventional pulmonology. Then uh, FSM course in sleep medicine. He is also a uh, European diploma holder and FAPSR. He is a consultant interventional pulmonologist at Metro Group of Hospitals at Noida and Faridabad. So, uh, welcome, Dr. Lovlin. And Dr. Lovlin also has a talk about uh, management about cough, and he will give us lots of insights. And I think half of our work is going to be done in these two talks. The second talk is by our one more esteemed panelist who is very young, enthusiastic. Dr. Suprava Chakraborty. So Dr. Suprava is um, DNB in pulmonary medicine and she's working at Ames Hospital at Jharkhand. 
So, Dr. Suprabha, welcome to the uh, esteemed panelists. And uh, I'm sure that even in her talk, we are going to get lots of insights about this management of cough. And our uh, final panelist, who is um, again a very young, enthusiastic senior resident in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, after finishing his MD in uh, respiratory medicine, is Dr. M. Rajiv Naik. So, Dr. Rajiv, welcome to the forum. Uh, and he is at the Osmania Medical College at Hyderabad. So we have east, west, north, south, everything is there and uh, whatever we always feel that there are some different strategies about management of cough. If we get some other prescriptions some from other city, so we always feel that, oh, where this prescription has come from and whether this particular state has some different way of managing or tackling our very important symptom of cough. So once uh, in discussion, our PG students were asking me, um, so, which is the very important symptom which you like to treat? Okay. So, in the respiratory, we get patients with fever, we get patients with hemoptysis, we get patients with breathlessness. Many of the times, if a patient comes to me with cough, I think this is something which has become, like we are so much tuned to knowing the sound of cough, to know the character of the cough. We can make out within minutes that, you know, this particular patient is just an allergic cough. So just give him, put him on steroids, put him on inhaled corticosteroids. Then sometimes we know that the patient comes with a cough, it's a whooping cough. Sometimes a patient comes with a wet cough, we feel, oh, this is bronchiectasis, this is interstitial lung disease. So there was once a paper which was published in one of the very important uh, journal. And this said that how much time a consultant will be able to diagnose a person based upon his or her clinical presentation. And you will be amazed to see the results. And the results were, it's actually seven to eight seconds. Okay. So seven to eight seconds is a very less period for any one of us to judge. But I feel that we shouldn't get carried away with these common presentations because we know there are a lot of times we have a lot of such varied presentations of cough that we get surprised. Just three days back, I had this patient who came from my native place. So very near, uh, very dear patients, those who come to us from our native places because they know your father, they know your grandfather and then they come to you with a lot of cough. So he came to me saying that he has intractable cough and which is there only for one month. So typically when he sat across, my usual thought that, oh, this must be allergic. So I asked him that whether you had this in the past no, I never had it in the past. You had sneezing, running nose. No, it was not there. You had fever. You had weight loss. No, nothing. Was he obese, obstructive sleep apnea? No, he, that was also not the case. Any drug history, any GI symptoms? Nothing. Nothing was there. And this person with intractable cough was finding from each and every doctor to find out what is the cause for his cough. The X-ray showed a very tiny left Hylar prominence, we got a scan done and day before we got his biopsy done and turned out to be adenocarcinoma. We did PET CT and PET CT is showing that he has metastasis in the vertebra, he has metastasis in the iliac bone, in the spine, everywhere. Okay, so one month of cough and you are getting a patient who is having a stage 4 lung cancer. This happened to one of my batchmates also, I cannot disclose her name. But he came to me with saying that Dr. Modi is a uh, cough specialist and he's in Ruby Hall Clinic, one of the pioneer institute in India. She came to me, we did her CT and showed multiple miliary motley. We thought that, okay, miliary TB is very much treatable. Did a transbronchial biopsy turn out to be stage four lung cancer. Okay, so we just cannot sit across and we just cannot say that, okay, this is an allergic cough. So as a pulmonologist, I think, each and every patient of cough who comes to us with a duration of more than three weeks, I think we should be very careful and we should have an approach towards the diagnosis and towards the management of this cough. And I'm sure that my all esteemed panelists are going to take us through these wonderful presentations about how do we approach a patient of cough. Sometimes even we get very rare causes. So I am going to ask each one of them at the end of the presentation that what is the craziest diagnosis what you got with cough? So I would like to share one more story before we begin with Dr. Uh, Suprova's presentation. So I had this um, young boy around uh, 25 years of old and he came again with an intractable cough. 
somebody had done his sputum gene expert and sputum gene expert turned out to be that ultra you must be knowing that sputum gene expert ultra can sometimes be very confusing so this ultra test turned out to be low detected rifampicin sensitivity indeterminate so this is something which is commonly we all are seeing in our clinical practice so this patient was put on anticox treatment he was with anticox treatment and i only initiated the anticox treatment based upon his gene expert report and he was coming to me for two months but every time i tried to ask him about something about his cough he used to say that nahi sir khasi aate hi rehta hai it is more after meals but then one day i thought that this person doesn't have anything on his uh, ct scan his gene expert is weak positive and he is not responding to anticox let's dig out more so i, I sat across i talked to him any surgery history in the past any medical history in the past then this time he had come with his mother and his mother said that at the time of birth he had a connection between his air pipe and his wind pipe and believe me i asked him to drink water in front of me and this person drank water and started coughing next day we did his bronchoscopy and turned out to be it was a tracheoesophageal fistula we closed the fistula by a surgical uh, attempt and this person had absolutely no cough since then so this was also a recent story so we get lot of such kind of varied presentations and as a pulmonologist i think we should always keep wide open our eyes before labeling that this looks to me like an allergic cough or this looks to me like an interstitial lung disease or this looks to me like just test tuberculosis okay so patients are coming to you from each and every corner of the city from each and every corner of india and they want some diagnosis so i am sure that today's talks are going to be very enlightening for all of us so i will hand over the session to dr suprava so who will have a presentation of around 10 minutes about the manage about the different etiology and how do you approach a patient of cough so dr suprava please start with the presentation thank you very much hello everyone thank you so much dr modi sir for this wonderful introduction and giving me the opportunity i thank you the total cci family and the mentors of the cci for today giving me the great opportunity to present in this platform to this topic the cuff of unknown origin so to think beyond the normal let's discuss first some cases a young female in our opd she is 17 years old came with complaint of heartburn and dry cough since 8 months she had frequent welching her cough had no seasonal and diurnal variation specifically she said that after each cough bout she had nausea or sometimes vomiting also few episodes she had lost some weight which was non specified and she had a lack of taste in mouth as well so looking at the initial complaints we were already thinking of maybe some associated gi cause her examinations were normal but the chest x ray suggested a mediastinal widening so when we ordered the ct thorax this revealed you can see both in the lung window and the mediastinal window that how uh, just below the trachea a huge dilated esophagus being seen very nicely so it was a diagnosis of dilated esophagus or achalasia so we send her for the further investigations like barium swallow and the esophageal manometry she was started on calcium channel blocker and prokinetics and her cough is improving gradually so it, it was a very atypical case in our opd coming with a chronic history of dry cough and came out as a achalasia next a 45 year old non smoker male came with complaints of intermittent nocturnal dry cough which was associated with wheeze and also shortness of breath of duration of 3 months he had no other significant history is a teacher by profession and no addiction so objective examination was not significant initial chest x ray was normal and spirometry also we saw a restrictive changes in contrast when we were suspecting of asthma there was no bronchodilator reversibility but the blood investigation showed a very high absolute eosinophil count that was nearly 9000 per microliter so when we 
asked for an hsct thorax it showed us beautifully diffused miliary opacity so we were thinking of a differential diagnosis of either miliary tb or the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia but the patient had no history of fever no weight loss no night sweats no lymphadenopathy mantu test was negative putum was negative and the repeated absolute eosinophil count was still high so we start put him on the ec 100 mg tit that is diethyl carbamazepine the standard treatment for tropical pulmonary eosinophilia for 21 days and also albendazole once in a week for 3 weeks and asked for a follow up and we saw a dramatic improvement in the patient symptoms within just 3 days we also sent a serum antifilarial antibody and we treated him as tropical pulmonary eosinophilia very common in this region though but it's very good when we can think of something else rather than the most common causes of cough to so cough what is cough we all know that it's a protective mechanism it's an explosive expiration against the closed glottis glottis which actually clears all the tracheobronchial secretions and the foreign materials so like all other reflexes cough has got, got also five components the cough receptors are throughout the upper and lower respiratory tract gi tract pericardium and diaphragm the vagus nerve is the afferent nerve for this uh, cough reflex the central cough center is located in the medulla oblongata efferent nerves are phrenic nerve spinal motor recurrent laryngeal and vagus nerve this efferent impulses goes to the muscles like respiratory muscles laryngeal muscles diaphragmatic muscles and bronchial smooth muscles and the cough reflex happens so whenever we want to dig something deeper rather than thinking of the common causes we got in our opd case we always have to stress on the detailed history as our always our teachers have said so duration is very important in acute cough is always less than 3 weeks we know the common causes are upper respiratory tract infection sinusitis pneumonia pulmonary embolism congestive heart failure sub acute cough duration is 3 to 8 weeks mostly post infectious upper airway cough syndrome also atypical pneumonia and tb chronic cough that is beyond 8 weeks of duration mainly upper airway cough syndrome is the most common cause along with asthma copd chronic lung diseases like interstitial lung disease eosinophilic bronchitis even other gi causes malignancy also drug induced like ac inhibitors foreign body substance abuse and also psychogenic so the character of cough is very important to find out because each of the character gives us a clinical clue about the diagnosis like when it is very sudden onset with a vigorous bout it's mostly in a seeming a foreign body aspiration or it's in case of a sudden aspiration of any food particles so when it is barking or croupy we know it's a laryngeal problem same like a paroxysmal barking give a hints about the tracheomalacia or the pertussis when it is typically nocturnal it can be because of bronchial asthma can be congestive heart failure or tropical pulmonary eosinophilia when patient complains that the cough increases after meal we can think about gerd or hernia when he is saying that the cough worsens after just after awakening so it give more hints about the bronchiectasis or the copd when the cough occurs during sleep so the tongue is falling back it can be because of the osa or it can be the post nasal drip and a honking cough but a patient clearly says it disappear during sleep we have to rule about it can habitual or the psychogenic cough as well so the associated factors with cough like other symptoms associated with cough gives us a lot of clue about our differential diagnosis like it's productive if sputum is there which character of sputum amount of sputum color and smell of the sputum it gives a lot of clear differential diagnosis It, if it's dry we can think of interstitial lung disease and other causes hemoptysis we very commonly we know it's associated with infective and non infective causes wheeze and dyspnea and exertion chest pain exercise induced or not if it is workplace induced we can always think about airway hyperreactivity if it is stress induced there are also various causes like somatic syndrome or tic every history gives us a point towards the etiology like chest wall deformity if it is unilateral it may be the lung or airway was involved if it is overall 
and the edema is also there it may be the cardiac dysfunction already started and the patient had failure to try we can think of any congenital abnormality immune deficiency think we can think about always to rule out the tb or the other atypical infection neural development abnormality very prone to aspiration related disorders childhood recurrent pneumonia history gives us a clue about the immune deficiency all the other congenital or genetic abnormalities when the patient complaining of difficulty during the feeding so we can think about the post cva neuromuscular disease or achalasia so when a patient comes in the opd and tells us that uh, in lying down in the lateral position and increase in cough we can think about pleural effusion abscess thus every every point in the history gives us the clinical clue clinical weakness so detailed history is very important so we have to ask all the questions to the patient like onset duration circumstances the relieving and exaggeration factor of the cough the nature of progression variability triggering factors associated symptoms the impact of the cough on the regular activity of habits lifestyle comorbid conditions perinatal history like from childhood infection or not which medications he has been on and importantly vaccination history as well so very uh, common upper airway cough syndrome one of the most common causes are gerd this is a question and hull question here that is from ers guidelines we can use it to rule out if the patient is having gerd or not we can see there are various question we can ask the patient like hoarseness is a problem or not clearing a throat problem or not feeling like lump like sensation in the throat is a very common complaint it's there or not so it's been graded from 0 to 5 0 means no problem and 5 means severe so any score above 14 can be a cause of gerd so uh, let's see the last uh, i want to discuss two more cases in our opd a 77 year old male has non smoker presented with complaint of slowly progressive dyspnea on exertion that is mmr cigarette to he had early morning cough with mucoid sputum and chest tightness and that is since 2 years so we really had to dig into his history because he was not working since 20 years but later he said that he has worked in a micro factory 40 years back for the duration of nearly 10 years he had no atopia fever hemoptysis and uh, the objective examination was not very significant so initially did you think it's a copd no let's see look at the chest x ray the initial finding the upper this upper lobe predominant and the mid zone we see a very bilateral diffuse reticular opacity suggestive of pneumoconiosis and the spirometry revealed the restrictive changes patient we put on on symptomatic and the other investigation is on the way again a lady 32 years old came with a progressive dyspnea on exertion cough the cough was more at night and at supine position intermittent mild fever was also there along with palpitation and she has lost some weight also and the overall duration is 6 months orthopnea was there and mild chest pain was also there with exertion so on objective examination we found that her jvp was raised though there was no clubbing no edema and the respiratory system revealed few crepitations but when the cardiovascular system we gave attention to we or clearly murmur was audible look urgent extra was done and we found this this huge pericardial effusion she was directly referred to the cardiologist pericardiocentesis was done and it was of tubercular origin she is now on att and improving so thank you so much so we all understand how much the detailed clinical history is important to look beyond the common differential diagnosis of cuff to find out a uh, uncommon origin of cuff we really uh, need to think about it thank you so much for the opportunity thank you thank you dr modi for nice introduction first of all i want to thank thank you dr modi dr krishna and cci team for giving me this opportunity and thank you dr suprama for uh, providing a brief introduction on the cough so i'm going to discuss about management of cough of unknown origin cuo is she taking everything we have already discussed so we'll just move on how to assess the cough there are multiple methods to assess the cough the way we used to 
assess the cough in our history taking is through whether his patient is having cough and go his patient is passing the urine urine after conducting the cough so if patient is having all these symptoms we used to feel the patient is having severe cough but it may or may not be there with all the patients so there are some score system like vas vas is a visual analog scale which is mainly used for your pain system the score we give the score for the cough patient from 0 to 10 cm or 0 to 100 mm the 0 is minimal severity and 10 is and we can also use vas as a longitudinal comparison for before and after treatment also other method is cough score coughing score this is a quantitative scoring method and is assess the severity of cough and efficacy of the treatment after the providing treatment you can again take the score and see how much response patient can has in this daytime cough symptom score and nighttime cough score and symptom score both are recorded from 0 to 3 other questionnaires are chronic cough impact questionnaire chronic cough specific quality of life questionnaire lester cough questionnaire these are specific for chronic cough they are not for acute or subacute cough and they have shown demonstrate good reliability validity and responsiveness to the treatment another method is cough frequency monitoring in which we don't measure the cough severity we see how many times patient has cough is cough frequency is used for cough severity and treatment efficacy also another method is to assess the cough is cough provocation test in which basically we try to see no causes or hypersensitivity of the cough to like in most of the times in neurogenic cough in patients in which we are suspecting the cough is maybe because of the cough hypersensitivity at the middle of lung gutta or efferent nerves this is not a routine test in basically we give a nebulized aerosols to generate the cough mainly capsaicin it quantitatively evaluate the chronic cough and like our bronchial provocation test we measure c5 here like the what is the lowest concentration of capsaicin which is inducing five or more than five coughs like this c2 can also be measured and both of these c2 and c5 can be used to assess the cough frequency severity it gives the quantitative assessment but it cannot be used to assess the cough frequency and severity it is a safe procedure well tolerated and you can repeat and what we have found after doing this test is the women have higher cough sensitivity compared to the men the routine investigations which can be done is chest x ray and pulmonary function test for cough because pulmonary function test is there is a bronchodilation present or there is a lung function is there then you can definitely say that patient have having bronchial asthma pheno and blood eosinophilia these are bit test which are surrogate marker for your sputum eosinophilia if patient sputum eosinophilia is positive then you can think the patient may be having cough variant asthma or eosinophilic bronchitis other than eosinophilic asthma but yes all we know sputum eosinophilia is bit difficult to assess and also proceed in such cases pheno and blood eosinophilia can be done but yes if both of these are negative also it does not mean that you cannot suspect eosinophilic bronchitis or cough variant asthma other test which you can do is esophageal manometry if you are suspecting gerd gastroesophageal reflux disease then sputum for eosinophilia sputum asb in india it is definitely required laryngoscopy to assess any upper respiratory tract examination like any epiglottis uh, carcinoma or urt cancer or something like methacholine challenge test to assess your asthma also to confirm your diagnosis of bronchial asthma also and to rule out the tc chest ct if you ask me whether chest ct is recommended in all patients for cough no it is not recommended for all patient you should always take the history properly and assess do you really require chest ct because ct always has a chance of expo radiation exposure so definitely whether you if you are ordering for chest ct assess your patient history and then order for chest ct score bronchoscopy it may or may not be required for all the patients it definitely may be required if there is a sudden cough then if you are suspecting some foreign body if you are some suspecting some carcinoid or 
some other lesion or some polyp or something spurred or some ulcer type of the lesions in your endobronchial issues. Then only you should go for the bronchoscopy. Otherwise, most of the times you may not require bronchoscopies. If you move on the treatment chart, then antitussis, there are multiple antitussis are available, but they are, can be central and periphery acting. First of all, central acting. Central acting are narcotics and non-narcotics. For narcotics, they are rapidly and directly inhibit some medulla oblongata. It suppresses the cough and it has analgesic and sedative effects. The other drugs which are available are codeine and folcodine. But only issue with this codeine and folcodine is addiction potential because they give analgesic and sedative effects. Other non-narcotic uh, molecules are dextromethorphan, which does not have any analgesic and sedative effects. It does not have any addiction potential. Other drugs are pentoxivarin and dextorphan. Both of them are non-narcotic drugs. Pentoxivarin, it usually causes, should be avoided basically in patients who are having glaucoma or patients who are having some heart blocks. Dextorphan is an active molecule of dextromethorphan and it can be a future drug for your inhibiting the cough. Antitussis, which are peripherally acting, they inhibit at least one element in the cough reflex arch, like your efferent, if you are central, or your efferent. Most of the time, these are local anesthetics and mucosal protectors. The drugs which are there is narcotin, it is alkaloid. Its effectiveness is almost similar to codeine, but does not have any analgesic properties. Benproperin, it is a non narcotic drug two to four times more stronger compared to codeine and it inhibits peripheral efferent nerve and the cough center. Mogestin, it is peripheral non narcotic antitussive drug and it is relatively stronger than codeine but not as strong as joint proper. Benzontate, it is a local anesthetic that is derived of tetracaine. It inhibits the efferent nerves of cough reflex. Levodroperazine, it acts on C fiber sense the effort, sense the antiflex, inhibit the cough. All these drugs have a short-term symptomatic relief so that your other drugs like your anti-inflammatory drugs or maybe uh, the, the pathology for which you are treating the patient, for that time you will get some time. The patient will feel better. So in all these, these all these peripherally acting drugs will give some short-term symptomatic relief. But these peripherally acting drugs you cannot be given in patients who are having upper respiratory tract infections. They are very unlikely they will respond with peripherally acting antitussis. For these patients, you will require centrally acting drugs. Mucolytics. Mucolytics, they improve the airway clearance. Their effectiveness is a bit controversial. There are some studies which have shown good results, whereas some studies which have shown less response. So we just definitely require more evidence for giving these drugs. The molecules which are guafensin, guafensin, I assure you many of people know about guafensin. It increases the airway secretions, it reduces the sputum viscosity and it also causes bronchial dilation. Ambroxol and bromoxin, these are mucolytic agents, decompose the mucous acetic polysaccharide, decreases the viscosity of secretions, improves ciliary activity and also increases the concentration of antibiotics in this particular. And acetyl cysteine, it breaks down the sulfide bonds of polypeptide change of glycoproteins, hence reduce the viscosity of sputum. So all these drugs are reducing the viscosity of sputum and helps in bringing out the sputum out. Same with the carbocystine, which also breaks down the disulfide bonds of mucin. And hypertonic saline and manitol, they increase the hydration of airway secretions, so improve the rheology of mucus to enhance clearance. And it should be used with bronchodilators because they have a tendency to cause bronchoconstriction. So bronchodilation should be given before that, before these therapies, and after that, hypertonic saline or manitol saline nebulation can be given. So there are a lo lot of questions regarding the role of anti-acid drugs, PPI and S2 antagonist. So ERS guidelines in 2020 published, in which they say the routine use of PPIs have a potential risk of iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, hypomagnesemia, clostridium difficile associated diarrhea, osteoporosis, 
and related bone fractures, dementia, or pneumonia. The routine use of PPI should not be used for suppressing all type of cough or cough or CUO. But in patient in whom you are suspecting GRD or there are confirmed cases of GRD, then PPI and ST antagonist can be used. PPI you can use in a twice daily dose like Esmos Parazol 20 mg twice daily. You can also add on S2 antagonist if patient is not responding. You can also switch the molecule also if patient is not responding with the patient. If patient is having confirmed or suspected cases of GRD. In all these patients, anti-acid drugs should be given. Anti-asthmatic drugs for chronic cough, mainly drugs are inhaled corticosteroids and bronchodilators. In adult population, the short-term ICS trial is recommended, but it is a conditional recommendation and low quality evidence is there. It can be given only for two to four weeks and you can see if patient is responding or not. Patient responding, you can continue this therapy. There are multiple RCTs regarding these and the response is heterogeneous. It has not shown consistent results on all the studies. That's why it has to be given on a trial basis. But if you are suspecting patient is asthma, COPD or cough variant asthma, then low dose ICS formatrol as per your gold GINA guideline, it's recommended as, as a recommended therapy. But it is not a treatment for your blanket treatment for your CUO. anti leukotriene therapies, these can be given for two to four weeks and these can be also given on trial basis. There are only two RCTs regarding anti leukotriene therapies and both these RCTs had shown good results with a leukotriene therapy but only in patients in whom there is a eosinophilia is there or asthma is there. Otherwise the patient on which there is it is also not recommended for as a blanket therapy. That's why it has been recommended as a trial basis therapy and side effects are very less with the leukotriene therapies. Some people have used pro-motility drugs like most common drug which has been used is macrolide therapy. It can be used as a one month trial basis in chronic bronchitis. Bacterial resistance is a common side effect with these drugs. Azithromycin 250mg thrice weekly 8 weeks and erythromycin 250mg twice daily for 12 weeks. ECG should be done before prescribing these therapies. And in patients with COPD, they provide significant response. But in patients who are having unexplained cough, the significant response is not seen. So you should choose your patient smartly when you are prescribing macrolide therapy. Other drugs which can be used, paclopan, metaclopromide, domperidone. But there is no major RCTs which are being done on these studies. Some studies, there is a mixed results with these drugs also. Neuromodulators, pregabalin, gabapentin, tricyclics and opiates. Which can be used in patients having chronic cough or CUO or patient in which you are suspecting a neurogenic type of a cough. The main drug, morphine, low dose, slow release morphine, 5 to 10 milligram price daily can be used for chronic refractory cough or CUO. The recommendations are strong regarding morphine therapy and there is a moderate quality evidence. If you are giving a low dose slow release therapy, then yes, the dose which it gives does not cause the respiratory depression. Side effects are constipation and drowsiness. Single RCT has shown good results regarding the morphine therapy. According to that, these recommendations are being made. Gabapentin, it can also be used, but recommendations are conditional and quality of evidence is low. 1800 milligram, which is the maximum dose which you can give, and single RCTs which has been done on this also shown good results. Pregabalin 300 mg, also conditional recommendation, low quality evidence, only one RCT was done, it has shown good results. But with all these drugs, side effect profile is higher, like addiction potential, withdrawal, constipation, mood changes, other things, and sleepiness, daytime sleepiness, all these issues are known. So all these drugs should be used when patient is having chronic cough which is not responding to any therapy then only and these therapies these molecules should be used carefully these are not the molecule which can be used uh, left and right for each and every patient other molecules are like ipraprotropium 
it blocks the efferent limb of cough reflex decreases the stimulation of cough limb of cough reflex and it also decreases stimulation of cough receptors by altering the mucociliary factors this helps in upper respiratory tract infection and chronic bronchitis other drug induced cough the treatment for drug induced cough is stoppage of the drugs most commonly is antihypertensive drugs like ace inhibitors after stopping of the drugs the patient symptoms will really relief in 1 to 4 weeks so if you have stopped the therapy at least you may have to take one week of the time and sometimes this can take up to 3 months also so it is always better when ever you are suspecting chronic cough and patient is taking such drugs you stop them and let's just wait for the response if patient cough subsides then your diagnosis also confirm and patient also feel better otherwise there is no test to justify your uh, your diagnosis thank you and i think we'll just move on now to dr mahavir modi for his opinion regarding all these lectures thank you Thank you, Dr. Lovelin, and uh, thank you, Dr. Suprova. I think both the talks were excellent, and Dr. Suprova, you have managed to cover almost all aspects about the character of cough and how does a patient. There are very, there were very good four interesting cases were there. This achalasia cardiac case in the patient with tubercular pericardial effusion, then a patient with tropical pulmonary eosinophilia. I think really hats off. Uh, you have covered almost everything and uh, all different variety of presentations of cough. Total lovely, your presentation also was indeed very good and uh, lots of insights about the new drugs, about the existing drugs, where you have to use antitussives, uh, about the pregabaline and uh, uh, the, how do you assess about the cough severity. I think this was something which was really new, the visual analog score for this cough as well as the coughing score, the daytime symptoms and the nighttime symptoms and quality of life questionnaire. So almost I think you have covered almost all the points and uh, we are already already flooded with the questions. So we have lots of questions before. I mean, I'm going to take all the questions. So uh, to all the attendees, please bear with us because we already have certain questions lined up. So first we will go through those questions and then take the audience questions as well. But uh, before going to the question, I think Dr. Lovely, there's a question for you from Dr. Muthu Kumar from um, Sivkasi, Tamil Nadu. He wants to know what is Pheno because in your presentation you meant, mentioned about Pheno, which is something which we are using. So just answer him in brief. You know, it's fraction, like I said, nitric oxide. It is basically used as a uh, surrogate marker to check for the eosinophilic air base. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, we will move on, and uh, I mean, we have excellent panelists. So uh, we'll start first with Dr. Vishnu Sharma. Dr. Vishnu, I would like to know from you that uh, we have discussed about the cough reflex, there are cough receptors, and there are afferent, and then it goes to medulla, then there is an efferent, and then Dr. Lovlian talked about how epirantrobium blocks the efferent pathway, and then it can uh, uh, abolish the cough reflex. So I want from you to know where all, all these cough receptors are present, because sometimes a patient comes to you with a very intractable cough. And they feel that it is coming from here. They sometimes feel that it is coming from the abdomen. Sometimes they feel that it comes whenever they eat in the ear. So that time they get this cough. So where are all these cough receptors are present? Yeah, it is very important to know the site of cough receptors apart from the lungs. Because we need to think of uh, other sites when the cause for cough is not very obvious. Upper respiratory tract, external auditory meatus, even few receptors in the internal ear. And then uh, upper GIT, especially esophagus and stomach, diaphragm, pleura and pericardium. These are the sites where cough receptors are present apart from the airways. So any disease affecting any of these organs can lead to a cough where the cough may not be very obvious. The cough due, due to irritation external external auditory meatus is quite common, especially patients may have the habit of uh, putting something and you know then they can get a cough. And in um, uh, mid-layer as a cause for cough, 
is common in children especially infections of the mid layer and an impacted wax is a common cause for cough in children disease of the pericardium as one of the, um, our panelists has already talked about sometimes you know pericarditis can be the cause for cough patients with upper ga diseases may present with cough because of the upper ga diseases predisposed to aspiration and other other things and we have seen time and again many patients with um, obstructive lesions of the upper ga especially esophageal carcinoma presenting more with respiratory symptoms than the GI symptoms, symptoms. Rarely a tumor below the diaphragm can irritate the diaphragm and can uh, lead to cough. That is why it is very important to know the site of cough receptors. So whenever the um, cause for cough is not very obvious, we need to look into these areas which could be a cause for cough. Excellent. I mean, all points are very well taken and the impacted wax and coming with children, I think it is one of the very important cause for the cough. Although uh, now there are certain questions about the character of cough and we being pulmonologists, we know when a patient comes to the clinic and uh, by hearing to the sound acoustics or the acoustics of the cough, we come to know and Dr. Suparova has uh, mentioned very well about the different characters of the cough. But still for our listeners, uh, are there any specific patterns which uh, you would like to mention, Dr. Gopal Krishnan? So what are the characters of cough where you can identify or pinpoint that oh, this is this? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Modi. Uh, yeah, definitely, we, uh, we need a proper history while evaluating the cough. Dr. Suprava has already mentioned about the characteristics of cough. Suppose if you take acute viral infection, usually the cough should be like it's a dry cough or it's a tricky cough. It's associated with like running nose, throat pain and irritation. May last for two to three weeks. But if you take a subacute cough of uh, post-viral etiology, may run for three to eight weeks. Usually it should be dry. So... Proper history can help you the, in getting the diagnosis. And uh, especially bacterial pneumonia, we have cough, uh, especially in uh, early phases of the bacterial pneumonia, cough should be dry and sometimes associated with uh, chest pain that because of uh, pleurisy. But in the later phase, cough may turn into, ex uh, like some mucoid uh, expectoration will be there. And sometimes the color of expectoration can give you a clue while evaluating the cause of pneumonia, especially if you take like rusty sputum can indicate a streptococcal pneumonia, green sputum, pseudomonas, and black maybe fungus. So these are the things we need to get uh, uh, while evaluating the cough. Uh, the history can help you always. And if you look at the cough due to chronic inflammatory diseases like asthma and all, cough will be very specific. Cough usually in asthma will be associated with wheezing and chest tightness and uh, breathing difficulty will be there. But the cough alone is a lone manifestation of cough variant asthma. And if you look at the cough acoustic, uh, the supervisor has already mentioned about the like, characteristics of cough, like whooping cough is a characteristic of uh, pertussis infection. And barking cough commonly we'll see in acute uh, laryngotracheal bronchitis of probably a viral etiology and the hawking cough in smoke. Uh, so these are the different uh, characteristics of cough. Uh, then we have to keep it in mind while evaluation of cough. And if you look at into the drug-induced cough, most of the times drug-induced cough will be dry. Uh, and uh, cough with the bronchial cases usually associated with uh, some amount of mucoid production. And if it is uh, having infection, so cough, uh, the expectation uh, will be will turn into the specific pattern, like depends upon the underlying infection. And uh, cough in chronic bronchitis may last for a long time with uh, and uh, Cough with uh, postural variation again indicates that like what, uh, where is the separative part of infection. Suppose if a lung abscess is there in the which side of the lung that depends upon the uh, that frequent, that uh, quantity of expectation will be more specific on the opposite side. So these are the things we should my, keep it in mind while evaluating the cough. Okay, excellent. So because you just made a point about the hooping cough, I will just like to tell you that why it is called hoop. Anybody can tell me why it is called whooping cough? Because it's like a snake or a cobra. So when the cobra takes its position, so that time the sound which comes, that is called a hoop. Okay. So the patients, they get so much of severe bout of cough that after a bout of cough, they are so much breathless that they tend to inhale air very deeply. And that's the sound which gives rise to... That is the hoop. So that is the reason it is called hooping cough. And I think something which uh, you people might not have heard in the day-to-day -day practice, but there were uh, era where the uh, hooping cough was definitely 
uh, used to be there in the pediatric population and we still see a lot of patients. I had uh, in between one patient who had a severe bout of cough and then we came across a very different entity which is diagnosed in this particular patient and because of the cough, this person developed lung herniation. So have you heard about this lung herniation? And then when we search about it, there are only say around 30, 35 cases which are reported in the literature. So what happened was this patient was coughing so vigorously that in between the rib cage, the lung came out and then it has come out through a narrow tunnel to the pleura. And now you can feel the lung tissue of boggy swelling just beside the chest wall. And we have reported this case. So it's a very, very unique presentation. The patient has a lot of pain. He's financially driven, so we are not able to operate him. But definitely these patients, basically what they need is uh, operation. So we have to be kept in mind. These complications need to be kept in mind. We had one patient of whooping cough, and then he came with severe subconjunctival hemorrhage. So he had uh, absolutely both uh, eyes were red eye, and then he was taken to ophthalmologist, and from there, this patient was referred and then was diagnosed as whooping cough. Okay. So these are like different variations of cough. So uh, Dr. Raju, uh, because Dr. Uh, Gopalakrishna mentioned about the drug-induced cough, and there is one more uh, question in the chat box also about the drug-induced cough. So would you like to tell us about what are different kind of uh, drugs uh, which you use commonly and they can be associated with cough in our clinical practice? Thank you, sir. Uh, we need to know regarding the drugs which are causing a cough. Coming to the commonly used drugs, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and uh, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, opioids and the statins. These are the commonly using drugs causing cough. So what is the mechanism behind it? So when we are angiotensin converting enzyme is, is, is mediates the mechanism in which bradykinin and substance free degradation. These are the two mediators which causing the cough, but when we are using the inhibitors for the angiotensin converting engine, these uh, accumulation of these such, uh, substance P and bradykinin will be there. So by the mechanisms, prostaglandin uh, prostaglandin synthesis and uh, uh, arachnoic acid derivatives, this will lead, there will be an increase of histamines and other uh, mediators. Those will cause the cough. So this is the primary mechanism behind angiotensin, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. Coming to clinical features, what are the features? Uh, the, there will be a persistent dry cough along with other side effects causing by AC inhibitors. Those are like angioedema. Then what? How to diagnose the drug-induced cough? Uh, when you are when you are there when there is unexplained uh, persistent cough. Uh, cause, when we are using the drugs, which there will be a potential to cause the cough. When we stop it, there will be a relief from the cough. So the other drugs which are causing cough, uh, cough are opioids like fentanyl uh, and statins. Uh, by the mechanism which opioids will increase, cause the cough is there, there will be inhibition of sympathetic outflow and there will be a enhancement of parasympathetic outflow. So parasympathetic system will cause the bronchoconstriction and cough. Uh, the, other, the other features along with cough or bronchoconstriction will be there. We will be usually seen it in the perioperative settings like when we using in fentanyl. The other drug coming to cetacliptin. This is a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor which, will, which we are using commonly in the diabetes 2 management. So there will be other symptoms associated with the cough or right area, this uh, dyspnea and wheeze. The mechanism behind the, this drug is this may aggravate the underlying allergic conditions. The other drugs causing, uh, the rarely causing cough are topiramate, fentina, phenytoin, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and omeprazole, leflunomide. Leflunomide is a uh, anti rheumatic drug, disease modifying anti rheumatic drug. This is also, this will also cause the cough. Uh, the other calcium channel blockers also will cause the cough. So before coming to the diagnosis of uh, unexplained cough, we should take the history regard, clear history regarding the drugs which are using, which may potentiate to cause the cough. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rachu. And I think uh, you have covered almost uh, everything about this. And uh, only one confusion that opioids, I think you are very particular about, you talked about the fentanyl. So maybe on the operation table, when somebody is inducing with a the fentanyl, they may get a cough bout. But 
the opioids can be very good cough suppressant also and also as dr lovely mentioned in his presentation that uh, we can use morphine tablets for intractable cough even we are using a lot of codeine preparations huh? so we have a lot of patients and i think all pulmonologists they use cough suppressant codeine is one of the very important uh, cough suppressant and one more thing again dr muthu kumar also wants to know because we are discussing about the drug induced cough is asking whether beta blockers can cause cough and how safely we can use beta blockers would you like to answer this dr rajiv yeah are you uh, okay am i audible <laughs> okay so i will answer on his behalf that yes beta blockers they do, definitely they can cause cough and especially if you have a non selective beta blockers they are the one which can uh, uh, cause cough but again if you have a patient with copd i think we should not be worried much about giving beta blockers in these patients because beta blockers have much more beneficial effect to be used in copd than the side effects of beta blockers if you have asthmatic with a clear cut hypersensitivity to a beta blocker then these are the patients where we may may not use beta blocker so we have certain patients where they get cough even with metoprolol or with non selective beta blockers but it is that way rare the effects are much more as compared to the uh, uh, adverse effects so i think we shouldn't uh, deal much about this now there is a question one more again in the chat box and uh, i think this question will go to uh, dr chakraborty so dr uh, uh, she uh, uh, this pay, uh, she wants to know i forgot the name of this doctor because there are a lot of questions and there is a lot of jumbling but anyway i may not take your name but the question her question was are there any specific conditions of cough in pregnancy and how do you manage a patient of uh, cough in pregnancy so uh, uh, dr uh, yeah dr suprova if you like to answer this yeah. yeah thank you for the question in pregnancy cough in uh, most common cases gastroesophageal disease 80% case this is the cause followed by bronchial mostly because of the hormonal changes during pregnancy that is increase in progesterone and estrogen and then few cases of allergic rhinitis so managing the gastroesophageal reflux disorders in pregnancy we need to counsel the patient give assurance some little bit modification in the lifestyle like frequent small meals the head end should be elevated during sleeping the lateral positions after all this if it is not effective then only we will uh, think about the drugs the pharmacological treatment there is no contraindication using the antacids and the h2 receptor antagonist and the ppis though rabiprazole there was no trial till date for the rabiprazole uh, teratogenic effect or not but omeprazole pantoprazole and esmoprazole being found safe among antacids uh, over the counter antacids which containing the magnesium trisilicate can have a side effect of nephrolithiasis later so over the counter use of the antacid is not being uh, very much uh, advocated and bicarbonate containing antacid should be also avoided uh, because over the counter use may cause the metabolic acidosis and the uh, fluid overload so otherwise the assurance and the common gr management will do now coming to the bronchial asthma the national asthma education and prevention society always advocates to treat the asthma as per the pre pregnancy state because if it is not treated the outcome on the maternal side and the fetal side uh, are more deteriorating because we can see the pre eclampsia the pregnancy induced hypertension the low fetal weight the preterm labor there are so many complications and uh, that is why the goal of the treatment is to prevent the acute exacerbation during the pregnancy so if in the pre pregnancy state patient has responded well to the asthma treatment the same treatment should have continued throughout all the trimesters so uh, there is no contraindication even in the moderate to severe asthma to use the laba and ics combination also no teratogenicity been found so uh, to avoid the use of oral corticosteroid in specifically in the first trimester normal asthma medication controller medication should be used and then coming to the pregnancy rhinitis and allergic rhinitis the normal decongestant and the the oral uh, antihistamines of older groups like diphenhydramine chlorpheniramine can be safely used in pregnancy and uh, we can also use the cough suppressant like dextromethorphan 
there is no teratogenicity found in the trials thank you sir thank you thank you dr subrava i think this is uh, uh, quite interesting that grd is the commonest cause of cough in pregnancy i will just like to share one personal experience i had this one pregnant female in the ninth month of pregnancy came with intractable cough and uh, the patient used to get breathless also but basically nine months of pregnancy they are not doing that much of exertion and then the, she was more at uh, bed ridden at most of the times obese lady and to our surprise we did a 2d echo and there was a saddle embolism in the pulmonary artery okay so because pregnancy is a condition where you get a uh, lot of pro coagulant activity it's a condition where the blood gets thick by itself so that's the reason that we shouldn't think uh, we shouldn't uh, forget about pulmonary embolism as one of the important causes of intractable cough in pregnancy especially in the second and third trimester when the patients are not moving much and they are more bedridden so coming back to dr lovelin yes you're there uh, now we have discussed about lot about grd and we know that the cough can be may not be only respiratory in origin it can be because of the arising from the different systems so um, we need like to highlight about any other extra thoracic origin about this cough and how does this patient comes to you and can you pinpoint the diagnosis based upon their history so first of all when we talk about the extra thoracic we should start from your upper airways we will just start from the air, nose from the sinusitis patient may be having a rhinorrhea or any upper respiratory tract infection then you should examine each and every area and also take proper history like epiglottis at the pharynx levels at the tonsils levels at the larynx levels all these should be included in your history taking in when evaluating a patient with a cough and sometimes you will see these patients most of the times because uh, they will cross over from the from ent to lungs lungs to ent it is always important other causes of uh, extra thoracic are like a patient is having any uh, ulcerative colitis gi causes can be there sometimes any irritation to your diaphragm can be there because of some pleural uh, irritation maybe liver abscess can be there splenic abscess pancreatic ab abscesses or pancreas pancreatitis all these upper abdominal causes sometimes ascites can also cause leading to the current episodes of cough another important is obstructive sleep apnea in which where your pharyngeal wall collapse will be there and these patients will definitely because of what happens there is a pharyngeal mass uh, so muscles relaxation occurs because of that diaphragm spasm occur because of the patient will develop a, a recurrent episodes of cough and they will typically say something gets a kuch atakta hai sometimes they don't feel comfortable so all these are some of the extra thoracic causes other rare causes can be like ulcerative colitis one plus or sle some connective tissue disorders like sle systemic sclerosis they can produce cough with or without involvement of the lung parenchyma sometimes they increases your uh, airway hyper responsiveness sometimes they causes bronchitis also and sometimes you don't may not find any specific etiology but they will still be coughing so these are some of the causes, extra thoracic causes of cough absolutely i think uh, you are covered almost um, yes yes anybody wants to add anything into this any other extra thoracic manifestation because sometimes we had this one patient of neurogenic pulmonary edema okay so this patient had everything intact okay there was nothing in the lungs and there was nothing in the heart i mean the function wise everything was okay the x ray was not clearing and then this patient had underwent a cna surgery okay about the spinal cord and after post surgery then he developed a intractable neurogenic pulmonary edema and this patient used to cough vigorously okay so we get these kind of uh, manifestations also where the patient may not have anything related to the lungs and the heart but still the patient has intractable cough because of this neurogenic pulmonary edema moving forward we have uh, okay one more thing we just want i just wanted to add was in the drug induced cough there is this one particular drug which you all must be seeing from your cardiologist and if you are not seeing you will definitely get a cardiac patient who's on this drug ticagrelor okay brillant ticagrelor so people those who are doing angioplasty and post angioplasty the patient is coming to you with intractable cough will you mean that you don't have to see the prescription but immediately will come to know that this is the ticagrelor induced cough okay so that causes a lot of cough almost the incidence is up to 8 to 10% so uh, this is something which you all should always keep in mind that a person coming from cardiologist after angioplasty with antiplatelets on ticagrelor will have intractable cough and they are not able to stop the medicine because i have 
uh, talked to my cardiac colleagues and then they said that no no we want to give it at least for three months and then we have to suppress the cough by giving some codeine or then maybe some small dose of steroids or whatever so anyway moving forward we have this dr mahendra singh ji mahendra singh ji kaise hai aap from madhya pradesh okay so he wants to know how to diagnose psychogenic cough okay so this is again a very important entity i would like to ask dr gopal krishnan so how do you diagnose psychogenic cough did you see any patient i think i see lot of patients <laughs> yes uh, psychogenic cough uh, it's uh, like very tricky and very difficult to diagnose and before labeling the psychogenic cough we need to do a proper evaluation and complete work up so after evaluating all the causes and how to exclude all the causes of cough then only you have to label the uh, names uh, psychogenic cough or somatic cough syndrome whatever it may be uh, and it's very difficult because most of the time it should be it, it will be refractory and uh, by doing proper counseling and uh, some like uh, non pharmacological cough suppressants as uh, so cough treat treatments like uh, uh, cough uh, suppressing techniques can be helpful uh, but it's very very difficult so you need to evaluate properly before labeling the uh, psychosomatic cough okay thank you can i add a um, few points regarding uh, psychogenic cough yeah yeah doctor basically it's a diagnosis by exclusion more common in children especially those who are recently joined school not so yeah. common in adults psychogenic cough characteristically occurs whenever there is a, a, a psychological disturbance especially when the school is forced to go to the school so in the morning when the, when the mother is preparing to send the child to the school classically the child will start uh, coughing but during weekends just like occupational asthma during weekends the child may, may be all right and when somebody is watching only the child will cough when the child is alone or playful the cough is usually will not be there and uh, this psychogenic cough will never disturb with any activities or sleep so it is basically a diagnosis by exclusion and more common in children Dr. Vishnu, usually it will be absent in the night times. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Gopal. Yes. It will be absent in the night times, and once if you deviate that attention, cough automatically disappears. Yeah, Dr. Vishnu, very, very nicely your experience spoke about this. Again, I would like to share a very important, uh, case, uh, a case about this. Uh, this was from Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Dr. Vishnu, Madhya Pradesh. Yeah, 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 Dr. Vishnu, what was happening that whenever she used to drink some water her cough used to subside so her grandfather found out an idea that he gave her a sipper okay so she used to carry this sipper and whenever she used to sip the cough used to subside whenever she used to take out the sipper she used to cough and believe me this 5 years old girl she used to drink almost 3 to 4 liters of water per day i mean she used to just keep on drinking water she used to just keep on sipping and sipping and sipping so that is how it was absolutely psychogenic cough the patient was from nasik she came to me we had to give some dose of amitriptyline and then our usual formula of cough suppressant and some inhaled corticosteroids some steroids and then involving the child counselor and with all that her cough absolutely subsided and she never used to cough throughout her night but i remember this and i have shared this case with lots of forums and this is a typical example of uh, psychogenic cough so dr mahendra singh ji i think you have got your answer so uh, congratulations to all of you because we have 1170 live participants at present so uh, thank you very much for joining in and i think we will give complete justice to your questions and please put your questions in the uh, chat box because dr vishnu you have answered very nicely in one of the, the next question goes to you from the panelist and this is our very dear panelist dr pradeep chatterjee i don't know from where dr pradeep gets so much of energy but he is always enthusiastic and he wants to know about how do you manage intractable cough in interstitial lung disease or in patients with ips so any take on this you would like to answer about this uh, dr vishnu yeah it is really challenging um, to control the cough in uh, interstitial uh, lung diseases whenever patient has got cough we need to be whether the cause is or not a cough which doesn't serve any purpose and it is dry 
it needs to be suppressed but most important is whenever there is a cough we need to auscultate the patient ca carefully if there is a bronchospasm give a bronchodilator rather than a cough suppressant especially in the patient because cough is a very common symptom in patients with uh, bronchospasm if you relieve the spasm the cough will uh, subside basically the treatment for cough in interstitial lung disease is very challenging challenging antifibrotics and cough suppressants are the way out and the newer uh, non sedating cough suppressants may also help in these patients yeah very rightly answered and uh, i will just add certain points into this dr tradi and you also must be knowing and you must be using as dr lovely mentioned about the gaba pain treat so this is one particular drug which uh, we do use and i do use commonly in clinical practice for suppressing cough in patients with interstitial lung disease there is one more drug which is the thalidomide okay thalidomide is again been used very commonly especially in post covid fibrosis i don't know whether to call it as fibrosis or not but we are using it in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis if they come to you with a very intractable cough again this is one more important drug which can be used one more drug which i use in patients with ipf is um, uh, nebulized xylocaine and then sometimes i have even used desperate sprays of xylocaine so what we use it as a pre bronchoscopic 10% xylocaine spray and you feel that the patient gets coughing from the lot of irritation in the nasopharyngeal airway i spray them with a a uh, xylocaine spray or a lignocaine spray so there are certain things which uh, we do in patients with ipf but believe me there are studies which say that the cause of cough in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is most of the times 60% of the time it is not the lungs which cause cough it is the extra thoracic origin and the grd which is a commonest cause of cough again in patients with ipf so many times it may be the upper airway uh, which is causing cough in patients with ipf it may be grd which is causing the cough in patients with ipf so we have to address these issues many times these patients they are those who are on the home oxygen therapy they may not be having adequate humidification of their oxygen which is causing cough many of the time these patients are having along with them they have obstructive sleep apnea which is causing the cough so we have to find out because for interstitial lung disease we are anyway giving them antifibrotics we are giving them steroids we are giving them bronchodilators as dr vishnu said so we are trying to cover but always try to find out if there is any extra thoracic cause for cough in patients with interstitial uh, lung disease in the antifibrotics you have a choice you have nitridine we have a perfenidone so perfenidone has a slightly upper edge over nitridine in depressing the cough reflex okay so if you have a patient with interstitial lung disease who has intractable cough i think and if you want to know which kind of antifibrotic has a better action so perfenidone has a better effectivity in depressing the cough reflex as compared to nitridine so moving forward lots of questions lots of questions okay so um, okay i will again come to dr uh, uh, chakraborty you are there dr uh, i forget your name all the time sapuva sapruva <laughs> okay sorry for that but then um, i would like to know from you what are the indications for uh, yeah we have discussed this in the presentation but again for our listeners because there is a question in the chat box that um, which anti tussives do you use commonly and which are the cough which you like to suppress and which are the coughs where you don't like to give anti suppress anti tussives mm. yes sir sir it's suprabha and oh. thank you for the question i think we uh, we have uh, all discussed and vishnu sir also just described right now when we will suppress it is either symptom specific or it is disease specific so in symptom specific cases when we are using the cough suppressants is mostly in upper respiratory tract infections laryngitis pharyngitis anything above the lungs Uh, when we want to short term cough, uh, want to suppress the cough reflex or the cough receptor hypersensitivity we want to suppress them for the short term and there is no other systemic abnormalities we found then we use the cough suppression other symptomatic wise in case of hemoptysis when it is life threatening we would like to give a cough suppression as well and in the disease specific cases when the underlying disease treatment has been optimized and as vishnu sir said there is no bronchospasm no secretions is there the cough is dry and it is retractable like chronic retractable cough uh, with underlying lung diseases in case of end stage chronic lung diseases for uh, sometimes for palliative care also we can give the cough suppression dr lovelin already in his presentation showed us like how categories of there i'll just repeat uh, that in short 
that cough suppressants are opioid and opioid derivatives and the centrally acting and the peripherally acting so opioids is a codeine falcodine hydrocodone uh, dextromethorphan they have, and the peripherally acting are mainly the local agents which are the uh, nerve receptors are being desensitized locally by them like demulcents like linctuses menthol eucalyptus oil and uh, this can be used for the mild cough and uh, sometimes there uh, we ask the patient to in the vaporized form also to use all this and benzonated very commonly these are used even after post covid cough post covid dry cough this has been used and nowadays we see levodro propizin these agents are being used a lot for the peripherally acting uh, antitussives and uh, as neurogenic cough is already already been described like pregabalin gabalin amitriptyline can be used and uh, in case of malignancy palliative care we are uh, giving the nebulization with bupivacaine or lidocaine and pre procedure also before bronchoscopy so the, these are the common thing and in case of hemoptysis can be codeine or dextromethorphan either of the agents can be used so these are the common things we use as a uh, antitussives absolutely lots of insights thank you dr uh... chakraborty i will call it chakraborty only because uh, lots of uh, good insights about this and uh, okay lovely is smiling so lovely next question to you you talked about this esophageal manometry okay so i would like to know from you do you do this test or do you ask some of your colleague to do this ph monitoring test and have you been able to diagnose that this patients like in uh, uh, for one of the cases what we discussed was the dilated esophagus and achalasia so Have you any time preferred a patient for a pH monitoring or a manometry, and uh, how do you diagnose these patients with intractable cough? First of all, I don't have any personal experience. Like I have not never used the machine, but I have just seen it with our gastroenterologist, okay. and uh, they have this machine, and uh, very it's like a simple uh, rice tube like a uh, machine, yes. in which you just pass it through your nose and just uh, insert into your esophagus. So there are two things in this. One is the pH monitoring device in which they measure the pH, your acid reflux. Another is an impedance monitoring also, in which they measure your non-acid, like bile reflux also. So very rare. Some patients are there which in which impedance monitoring monitoring will be required. But most of the time, acid reflux will be there, and you will be able to measure your acid. Plus, they will see according to the level of the reflux. Okay, at what level this reflux is there? Accordingly, they will decide. plus how much reflux is there and also they also see a sap score also and a system like how many times like a patient is having reflux and his patient is still having cough or not it's not like patient is having only reflux whether it is causing cough or not it is also important for them. because there are many patients who may be having reflux but all of them is not going to cough so accordingly their score is there plus they have a d master score also if it is more than 8.5 also then according to that you will find that yes patient is having reflux and the it say the cause of the grd related cough only. so yes and the device has to be used for 18 to 24 hours yes and uh, it, sometimes it becomes cumbersome like it is a holder device which you used in our ecg and always the tube will be hanging from your nose so patient will not feel comfortable in going out in social activities and uh, that is one of the issue with this and there are many issues like you have to stop your ppi 7 days before 3 days before you have to stop your all antacids and, and you have to stop all uh, uh, acid producing foods also so all these issues has to be uh, sorted out before after that you will use for 18 to 24 hours and then report will come but yes it gives the answers to your Yes. Yeah, so yeah. sometimes we do get patients with lot of intractable cough, and we are just not able to figure out. The patients are already on inhaled steroids. They have taken lots of cough suppressants, and you are even the gastroscope is also not able to give you a diagnosis because the gastroscope is says only anterior gastritis or maybe mild lax uh, 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 junction. gastro esophageal junction that's it and we need to know the exactly the cause for these patients so i think in these patients the p esophageal ph monitoring uh, can be done for these patients so how do you manage these patients dr lovely any any take on this uh, how do you what treatment do you give to these patients so most of the time we we'll give uh, ismoprazole 20 mg twice daily has to be given it's not like once daily you have to give just to be given twice daily and uh, after you will follow this patient for after two weeks 
and see whether and is there any improvement in the patient's symptoms. If patient is not improving, you can change the molecule of esmoprazole to rabeprazole or lesprazole. New molecules are coming and mm -hmm. they have a better efficacies also. And otherwise, also you can add any ranitidine also along with this esmoprazole. Some patients, they still don't respond with these. In these AV patients, you can use some syrups like any digene syrups or any just to suprafil syrups or just to suppress that acidity also. And but if you use them properly, many of these patients will respond to this treatment. Yes. And one more addition, add domperidone or uh, those kind of drugs, suprapathetic drugs, so which will definitely prevent the reflux. So along with the antacids, I think if you combine them with a prokinetic agent, sustain release prokinetic agent. So normal, my yes. practice is to add an antacid with a domperidone, sustain release in the morning hours, and only a PPI inhibitor at night. So I think the combination of these two, along with some anti-anxiety like amitriptyline, it helps very well in these patients of GRD-induced uh, cough. So moving forward, I think I will go to one of the uh, big questions from this uh, uh, Dr. M. Pahuja from Indore, Madhya Pradesh. So she has a personal uh, patient who is uh, her mother-in-law. But I will take this question. Normally, we don't take any personal uh, uh, case-wise discussions, but because this is definitely something which we all will like to know from the discussion is going to be very good in this. My mother-in-law has long-standing dry cough, more than 10 to 12 years. Okay, this is not days or weeks, it's 10 to 12 years. Have got done all the tests. TB test is negative. No cough medicine seems to work on her. She starts coughing while she's silent. When she starts talking, eating anything spicy or sweet, if it is post-nasal drip or something else, what more tests or medicines could you recommend? Thank you. So, Dr. Pahuja, thank you for your question because I think whatever we have discussed up till now, I think you have to utilize each and everything whatever we have discussed. Okay, so it can be an allergic cough which is there for throughout the year. There can be some allergy inside the home. Perennial allergy can be there. But you are saying that she is getting cough more when she's silent and also when she starts talking, eating, anything spicy or sweet. So something which is causing irritation inside her upper airway. So I think that is the one. I am sure that you must have done her CT scan for the chest. You must have done a 2D echo also for her. You must have done a lung function test for her. Then we can do a test like pheno. We can do a test like bronco provocation test. We can do tests like gastroscopy to find out by chance if she has a reflux. So these are all the different First modalities, I think we will like to know by doing this and we like to, of course, rule out some interstitial lung disease. Sometimes it may not be very gross interstitial lung disease. It may be just bronchiolitis, which is very difficult to find out on a plane scan. So you have to do a HRCT, the prone and supine images, try to find out the allergen. So I think there are all the ways by which you should be able to find out. And I think after listening to our talk, you will be able to the better decision to find out the exact the etiology of the cough. And if there is nothing infective, if then you can definitely suppress the cough by giving one of the cough suppressants, either centrally acting or peripherally acting. So thank you for the question. Then we have this Dr. Vinod Rajput. Uh, Dr. Vinod is from Pune, Maharashtra. Okay, same place. Thank you, Vinodji. So please describe every practical approach regarding cough or respiratory symptoms in general practice for various age groups. Also give detailed guidelines and if possible examples with respiratory sounds for diagnosis. I think, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, but uh, this is out of, out of the today's scope and uh, uh, we can't go further because there are lots of questions already in the pipeline. But uh, I think today's talk will definitely help you in at least the management of the cough. Then we have Dr. Rashmi Purohit. So are there any relationship between the menopause and cough? Okay, so anybody will like to answer this. Is there any relationship between menopause and cough? At least I have not heard about, but then anything can happen with the hormonal imbalances. And uh, just like from this uh, this typical question, I have uh, one practical, uh, uh, one case which I would like to discuss. So I had this young girl, so who used to come to me every month. Every month she used to come with intractable cough. And then we find, found out that the cough was related to her menstrual cycle. So every fourth day in a month, she used to get this cough. And you must have diagnosed it just based upon the history. This was basically, she had this catamenial hemothorax. 
and she used to get with the pleural chest pain and an intractable cough and we diagnosed it by doing the subsequent x-rays and every time during her menses she used to get that endometrial deposit on her pleura and that may be the reason for her catamenial hemothorax very difficult to treat this patient but then she had to be taken by the gynecologist and then the further treatment was done by uh, by them so then dr sabil mirza from karnataka wants to know that what is the best cough treatment medicine i think you must have got your answer by now dr arun patil from mumbai uh, he has asked a question i think lovely in order dr vishnu can take this dr vishnu this is a question for you acetyl cysteine helpful in early covid 19 dry cough with chest x ray clear <laughs> so i think a million dollar question we all are finding very difficult to manage this post covid cough we are just not able to figure out what particular medicine we should be giving to this post covid so any role of acetyl cysteine in the post covid cough dr vishnu yeah, basically post covid cough needs to be evaluated in detail especially following covid the cough can be due to a lung disease or due to extra pulmonary disease also some patients do get the cardiac problems following following covid especially arrhythmias and um, then uh, low ejection fraction and other things also that's uh, so, why uh, worsening of the underlying comorbidities also can be a cause for cough or sometimes following a covid with uh, the diabetic gets worse so opportunistic infections and other things are also common so we need to differentiate whether it is just the post covid cough or is it, is it due to an infection or is it due to a cough due to extra pulmonary organ involvement especially due to the ca ca cardiac worsening where a pulmonary edema can also be a cause of cough so detailed evaluation is essential and depending upon the co cause uh, we need to treat if it is a dry a dry cough without any obvious uh, other se secondary cause then uh, the routine uh, tre treatment for cough is uh, cough is sufficient because the red flag symptoms in cough basically are if the cough is associated with other associated symptoms like hemoptysis even if it is a single episode breathlessness fever weight loss or other constitutional symptoms or any one or more of the other symptoms we call it as a red flag symptoms so cough associated with red flag symptoms requires a detailed eva eva evaluation in at any age group but a dry non productive cough without any other significant associated symptoms without any obvious cause a routine investigations like a basic chest x ray and basic blood investigations are uh, sufficient but one of the most important things what i have found out over the years is something below the diaphragm can be a cause for cough in many patients i have come come across three patients with uh, um, hepatocellular carcinoma coming with chronic cough okay. without any obvious cause did an ultrasound there was a lesion at the top of the liver which was irritating the diaphragm uh, diaphragm that was a cause and another patient had a, had a large uh, lymphoma affecting the adrenals bilateral adrenal lesions that is a rare rare disease again this large lesion was irritating the diaphragm that was a cause for his chronic cough young man rather diagnosed as a lymphoma that we have published and we had um, another patient who had a large retroperitoneal mass again uh, leading to cough so an ultrasound of the abdomen is essential in patients without any other obvious cause for cough and we came across a, another patient who had a paraneoplastic uh, manifestation cough as a paraneoplastic extremely rare Uh, a middle-aged man who came with the chronic cough without an obvious cause. As a routine, I did a, 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 a ultrasound of the abdomen that showed a renal cell carcinoma. So one of the rare causes for cough is a paraneoplastic manifestation, renal cell carcinoma. So an ultrasound of the abdomen is one of the simple, useful investigations when the co cause for cough is not very obvious. Sorry for deviating from the <laughs> topic. No, no, no. Say because this is such an interesting topic, the cough, and everybody has lots of patients to share. And thank you, Dr. Vishnu, for this uh, wonderful insight. I will also share one case. I just got this around one month back. One young boy, around eight years old, and he was doing something with his uh, wristwatch. Okay, so he had this plastic wristwatch, and he was doing like this. Okay, and suddenly that plastic wristwatch, uh, some this metal clip. it got dislodged and it went directly inside and then this patient had severe bout of cough so we had to go inside do a flexible scopy and we could take out by the flexible scopy so my next question about this and we get to get this foreign body aspirations and we do get uh, 
cough because of this foreign body aspiration. So, Dr. Rajiv is sitting quietly for a long time. So, Rajiv, do you have any practical experience about this and how do these patients they present uh, uh, to you? And I would also like to ask you about because we are always talking about the airway. So, uh, do the patients with OSA come to you with cough? So, I would like to ask you both the questions and you can answer them simultaneously about the foreign body and about the OSA. So, thank you, sir. Coming to OSA and cough. So, obstructive sleep apnea, the typical symptoms are snoring and excessive daytime and sleepiness. But there may be a sole manifestation, manifestation is chronic cough. So, the mechanisms which likely cause the cough in OSA. Number one is uh, gastroesophageal reflux. OSA and GERD. In OSA, if there is increased episodes of OSA, this will increase the transdiaphragmatic pressure in turn, which will decrease the tone of esophageal sphincters. So that will result in increased esophageal reflux. So CPAP therapy is the uh, main treatment for this. And uh, coming to another mechanism, OSA and upper airway inflammation. Recurrent trauma to the upper airway, secondary to obstructive sleep apnea may cause the uh, inflammation. And uh, leptin mediated systemic inflammation in obesity and its uh, spillover may cause the uh, cough. Coming to other mechanism, OSA and asthma. In asthma, there may, there may be a airway inflammation. When it come, when it are associated with OSA, there will be increased airway inflammation, hyper responsiveness in patients with asthma. OSA, OSA and upper airway pathology. Abnormalities in the soft palate, uvula, and upper airway musculature are in invariable in OSA patient. So there may be a recurrent obstructive events may cause the trauma and that may trigger the cough if it pops. The fifth mechanism, OSA and triggering respiratory infections. OSA patients experience frequent respiratory infections that may uh, initiate the cough. Coming to the treatment of OSA and cough, CPAP is the main treatment for the cough in OSA. CPAP that decreases the GERD by increasing sphincter tone. Second thing, CPAP decreases the nasal inflammation by humidification. Third, many studies have shown improvement in systemic and airway inflammation following CPAP therapy. This is regarding OSA and uh, cough. Coming to foreign body aspiration and cough. Uh, foreign body aspiration is a relatively common occurrence in children. Uh, so we have to know regarding the foreign body aspiration, how cough will present. When foreign body aspiration occurs, there may be a choking event followed by cough, followed by persistent cough. The, according to the location of foreign body impaction, there will be some, if one body is in the laryngotracheal area, there may be coughs, stridulousness of voice, and increased respiratory effort. If the foreign body discharges in the lower airway, there may be a cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. On examination, there may be a decreased breath sounds on the side of the foreign body dislodgement. So we have to take the detailed history regarding the uh, foreign body uh, aspiration and issue of choking. Uh, the, the, the what is the most common DD differential diagnosis regarding the foreign body aspiration, which the foreign body aspiration can closely mimic the acute asthma exacerbation. So we should not confuse uh, between the foreign body aspiration, acute asthma exacerbation. We need to take the detailed history regarding that. Coming to the diagnosis, how to diagnose the foreign body aspiration? accurate history and there should be high index of suspicion and the clinical examination that may reveal the decrease of best sounds on the same side and we should take on radiology there may be a abnormal findings in 40 to 80 percent of cases uh, we can by this we can diagnose the foreign body uh, aspiration how to manage the primary thing in the management of foreign body aspiration is we should secure the airway after that uh, we can uh, remove the foreign body by the bronchoscopy. Usually, we will prefer, prefer the rigid bronchoscopy than the flexible bronchoscopy. This is the briefly regarding the foreign body aspiration, cough, and its management. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. I think we have lots of DNP students, and you have answered them in writing about a 10 marks full question as if you have done a PhD in OSA and uh, this foreign body. Huh? So very detailed narration about all the points. Huh? Thank you very much. And uh, we will move forward. We have lots of more questions and time is flying very fast. So um, 
we know about that now we have discussed about lot of these therapies the cough suppressants the inhaled corticosteroids the tablet steroids somebody wants to know that can we use uh, montelukast and uh, steroid tablets in pregnancy induced cough and if montelukast is safe in pregnancy so anybody would like to answer this that is super super we like to answer this yes sir montelukast is safe in pregnancy but it is said that should it should be uh, for short term not over the counter used as there are no proper studies or rcts being done for the long term use of montelukast so that is by short term use there is no problem in pregnancy okay so now if you have come over on the uh, mic i would like to uh, know from you are there any specific non pharmacological therapies like speech therapy or some behavioral therapies what are used for the suppression of cough because especially in this post covid era i have this one young girl who is having this post covid cough almost for 2 years we must have done her n number of qd echoes we have done her ct scans once every 3 4 months and on lots of cough cultures and everything all kind of investigations pro bnp gastroscopy you name me and we have done the investigations and then here we want to know that we as dr krishna has introduced this term as cough of unknown origin so i feel really we don't know from where this cough is coming and here in these patients along with the pharmacotherapy we feel that there has to be some role of non pharmacological therapy so anything which you have come across or what you are using in your clinical practice sir so the cough of unknown unknown origin or the chronic refractory cough can be either even with a known cause or even with an unknown cause so uh, mainly uh, coming to the non pharmacological therapy some few therapies are coming in front today like cough control therapy and some point term uh, being coined like physiotherapy and speech and language therapy intervention which are nowadays used in uh, various rcts which are shown that when combined with the pharmacological therapy for neurogenic cough like pregabalin or uh, gabapentin it has shown that it quite a good result in many patients even in stage uh, chronic lung diseases the cough control techniques have been using a few people are using it and there are good results like uh, sipping of water controlling the urge when it is uh, for coughing or partially breathing then uh, acbt like active cycle breathing techniques like uh, relaxing breathing after that a deep breath then half of the breathing and then cough so these techniques at a time helping for maintaining the pulmonary hygiene on the laryngeal space hygiene as well as the mucus clearance and sometimes controlling the urge of the cough so there is a new uh, pharmacological therapy coming in the way which is called the cct cough controlling technique as well as physiotherapy combined with speech therapy so in uh, dysfunction specially where uh, there are paroxysmal vocal cord movements or laryngeal muscle dystonia or vocal cord palsy because of some secondary causes like malignancy or uh, post cva cases this speech therapy and language therapy is helpful even in habitual cough it has been very useful some rcts are showing that nowadays we uh, only in our opds in the part of the palmo rehab we have tried only in some ild patients and some very severe copd patient and it really helps when after optimizing all the inhalers and after multiple use of uh, oral corticosteroids throughout the year and even the patient is uh, having you know retractable cough the techniques helps thank you sir very nice very nice i mean there are a lot of insights about and we are really getting those point patients of cough so it is not like weeks ki goli lo khich khich dur karo so from that era to this kind of era where we have lots of diagnosis about this cough dr gopal krishnan you would like to add anything into this any non pharmacological therapy for cough and do you use any kind of other pathies i know it is not a forum to discuss about this but sometimes we are forced to use along with allopathy some homeopathy or ayurvedic drugs so have you used or any experience about this particular other pathies and other non pharmacological therapies are uh, you muted other mm -hmm. other pathies usually will not recommend but patients they post to go even we say don't go but but they will they prefer to take the homeopathy or all our ayurvedic medicines but sometimes we will also prescribe some ayurvedic preparations in our practice like uh, those containing menthol preparations 
uh, honey preparations that because these things can act as a soothing agents that can give symptomatic relief especially in man managing uh, uh, acute cough conditions like viral infections and all uh, but coming to the refractory cough uh, dr suprabha has uh, described uh, she discussed everything about uh, uh, refractory cough management uh, non pharmacological management of refractory cough and uh, i think uh, you have mentioned one case about one girl uh, whenever she sits that cough subsides that is another that was mentioned in the non pharmacological management of uh, refractory cough that is called uh, vocal or laryngeal hydration maybe uh -huh. some patients will have dryness of mouth is the reason for cough these patients may be benefited with uh, hydration of oral cavity so that that could be the underlying uh, concept behind uh, this treatment uh, i think uh, suprabha has covered everything about uh, this thing okay excellent uh, this hydration therapy i like it we have some more questions and uh, we have dr s jairaman from tamil nadu welcome dr jairaman and uh, wants to know that what is the role of intranasal steroid spray in patients with post nasal drip in suppressing cough opinion from the panelists so i think this has been proven beyond doubts and uh, we do use intranasal corticosteroids in these patients i think this is one of the chief therapies whenever you feel that a patient has upper respiratory symptoms and sneezing running nose and nasal blockage which is causing the cough we do use uh, intranasal steroids in these patients then a uh, the question from dr dipika dr dipika welcome to the forum what is the use of cough scoring system in general practice so i think uh, let's not go into the details of this but uh, uh, you may be actually using it in general practice huh? we are doing it in general practice we use it like how was it before and now how is it so with the medications how much is the improvement 25% 50% 70% <coughs> bother you at night time or is it only in the day time so i think this is the same kind of cough scoring system and then there are some visual analog scale which also can be used but i think uh, let's not go into the details of it because uh, there are more for the maybe the research or uh, huh, certain kind of skills which for cough we don't have that much of time in our busy clinical practice and especially in general practice to answer each and every cough with the uh, kind of recording system or a scoring system in this uh, very good discussion and then we have got lots of uh, participations and we have lots of uh, uh, praises for our workshop so thank you all the panelists for uh, Uh, i would like to ask just a final comment that we have discussed everything about cough we have discussed about the respiratory non respiratory we have discussed about the causes the bronchoscopy foreign body obstructive sleep apnea then dr vishnu sharma has presented a very good uh, case about non hodgkins lymphoma or hepatocellular carcinoma they are presenting as intractable cough so we do have this kind of funny presentations and we do get patients with this kind of intractable cough so after this all this batch of investigations still i want answer from every one of you as is that yes or no that after doing all of these investigations also whatever we have discussed maybe we are not doing tests like bronco provocation tests or we may are we are not doing the tests like a esophageal ph monitoring for each and every patient to label them but otherwise after listening to this i feel that we are from east west north south everywhere from india and we all have agreed to one point that whenever a patient of cough comes to us we don't uh, i mean we don't uh, do any other uh, we we don't fail to do any other investigation we are doing almost everything but still do you feel that do you have patients where you just don't know where this cough is coming from and shall we use this term which is called as cough of unknown origin which is cuo which is the name which has been given by our founder dr krishna so dr krishna it's a wonderful idea and i mean i am just in love with this particular phrase ceo ceo cfo and now the cuo and people will start referring patients to a pulmonologist just like a patient of pu we always give to infection disease specialist so same way we should be having our own entity and it will be there there in the medical fraternity that we treat patients with cuo or someone who is a ceo specialist okay so that kind of name will be there definitely in the air so all the panelists yes or no do you get such kind of patients where you are just not able to figure out the cause of cough is it yes or no from everyone yes everybody is putting so i think yeah dr vishnu you want to uh, yeah definitely yes because the most important uh, most common symptom in the respiratory medicine is cough and i think everybody will agree that the most difficult symptom to treat is also cough Yes. as i said we sometimes with them the laboratory is extensive investigations 
we do get a lot of patients where the cough we do not know still what the cause is and uh, the approach in such cases is to know whether the cough is really troublesome or significant as i told earlier if there is no red flag symptoms okay yes treat give symptomatic treatment but one or more of the red flag symptoms definitely requires uh, detailed evaluation yes. so cco definitely yes okay and uh, one more question is there in the uh, uh, discussion that dr lovely i would like to ask you that uh, do you get patients with multifactorial cough so it may not be only one cause it may not be like only grd it may not be only osa it may not be only interstitial lung disease so do you get this kind of patients with multifactorial cough again it's a very important way to diagnose and treat these patients because you may not be able to just like in pulmonary hypertension you would like to block all three pathways which are causing pulmonary hypertension so same way do you get a multifactorial cough in patients and how do you manage these patients i think better term is life is not fair when it go so here the practical when you come in your practice so like i just give an example if patient is having a asthma or obstructive airway disease with allergic rhinitis or sinusitis so this is a case in which you want to suppress the cough from the upper respiratory tract maybe maybe post nasal drip or something then from the asthma you want some mucolytic therapy or some bronchodilation so sometimes this three patient becomes more tricky this is very common thing many of times patient will have a copd with he may be using some drugs like ace inhibitors maybe some beta agonist so these are the some pathways these are some examples in which they patient is having a multifactorial approach sometimes of any patients with connective tissue disorders they may have some ild parenchymal disease plus some airway issues as a mostly seen in rheumatic rheumatoid arthritis so in this you need some bronchodilation plus you require some cough suppressants for your parenchymal lesion so your area from which receptors are going from where cough is originating maybe it may be from your upper respiratory tract maybe you're from grd and grd also it is quite common with these mm-hmm. things, like ild and everything yeah. yeah. parenchymal cough is, you require some parenchymal lesion maybe some pleuritic you require cough suppressants so these are the combination and you'll find multiple combination multiple findings and as we have discussed earlier also we should be able to identify what type of cough it is how where from where with the sound we should be able to see yes it is originating from here it is originating from here most probably it is originating here and sometimes we'll give the therapy patient will have 20 to 30% or 50% relief but he may not have complete relief it means there is some more originating point and you need to treat that absolutely yeah. absolutely amazing i don't know whether i should quote it or no but there are patients where in the day time i give them expectorant but the cough is so much bothering to them that at night i ask them to t- i ask them to take a cough suppressant like codeine and at least go to sleep so i don't know how commonly you people are using this but this is something which is a multifactorial cough because the patient has bronchiectasis he has to bring out its secretions but at the same time you don't want him to cough out throughout night and bring out secretions if he doesn't get a good sleep of 8 hours his immunity will be hampered it will pro- prone him for more infections so keeping this logic in my mind so i think we all have our own ways of treating cough and uh, it's been a wonderful to interact with all of you i think uh, we have answered almost everything uh, dr uh, ranbush from andhra pradesh welcome dr Ran- uh, ranbush uh, so he wants to know that uh, some doctors are using tramadol infusion for suppression of covid cough is there any rationale for this please reply <laughs> so i don't know about this but there may be again it's a tramadol has an opioid property also so that may be the reason that uh, you know it can suppress some of the cough receptors and uh, patients may be feeling overall good because it's a wonderful analgesic also the patient gets some analgesia some amnesia and uh, maybe some uh, definitely depression of the cough reflex so uh, i think we are coming to the last part of it and we wanted dr krishna to come over but then he is uh, not willing to come inside so that's okay but dr krishna it was a very wonderful insight by bringing about this topic of uh, cough of unknown origin any other comments any other questions from the chat box which we have missed and anybody wants to take them i think we can definitely dr lovely you wanted to share something 
So we just uh, I, we have discussed one. I think somebody asked about the cough and the menstrual cycles. Yeah. So uh, I was just going through some reports. So it's maybe because of some asthma. Asthma variability can be seen with the menstrual cycle, and uh, it is mostly seen from the tenth day to twenty second day. And uh, during the ovulation, it may decrease, and uh, asthma symptoms increase. Sometimes the people have started wheezing also. That can be one of the reason with the asthma. In this patient with a cough and menstrual cycle. Very rightly said. Very rightly said. Yes. Okay. So I think if you have covered everything, uh, we can close the session. Or uh, no, so I will again like to thank all the audience with one thousand two hundred logins and uh, people been stuck here, stuck here for uh, more than two hours, and we have overshot the time. Uh, so thank you everyone and all the panelists you are all wonderful both the talks were good and uh, all the insights all uh, answers were absolutely amazing and i myself have learned a lot through this particular webinar and thank you cci again thank you dr ravi bhai dr krishna dr vijay kumar and uh, dr atri so dr atri was the one who initiated with this and he said that uh, you might have seen a person who has never talked in his life there might be a person who has never talked a single word in his life but there won't be a person who has never coughed in his lifetime so this makes so much of sense because we feel that patients come to us mujhe kabhi zindagi mein cheek aaya nahi hai but you tell me a person who has ever told to you that he has never coughed in his lifetime so that much is the importance of this cough and uh, being a respiratory specialist i think we all should be thorough with our knowledge for about the management about the approach to our cough using this term of cough of unknown origin in our clinical practice day in and day out and uh, this will definitely enhance our practice as well as it will help better and better to our needy patients so thank you everyone for uh, listening and thank you sipla thank you cci for uh, this wonderful uh, uh, insight about this particular uh, talk or this for uh, this particular subject thank you everyone we can close the session thanks thank you everyone thank you thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you thanks a lot thank you thank you, thank you.